Hello, and welcome to the story of Rhode Island, the podcast that tells you the story of Rhode Island's fascinating history. In episode three, we watch Roger Williams create and then defend the town of Providence, the most radical society in the Western world. For episode four, we'll watch Roger Williams experiment in religious freedom grow when another group of religious outcasts flee Massachusetts in search of religious freedom. We'll start by taking a look at the leader of this group. She's a 46-year-old mother of 12 named Anne Hutchinson. It's November of 1637, and Anne's just been summoned to court by the Massachusetts magistrates. With the eyes of the crowded meeting house directed towards her, Anne Hutchinson stands there with a stoic look on her face. The people looking at her can be sharply divided into one of two categories, those who support her and those who wish to see her banned from the colony. The leaders of the latter category, the Massachusetts magistrates, sit high above her with an infuriated look on their faces. One of these men is the governor of Massachusetts and a man we've met before, John Winthrop. Sitting beside Winthrop is his deputy governor and a man who's known to be a ruthless disciplinarian, Thomas Dudley. While the two often disagree on how to deal with religious zealots, today they find themselves in complete agreement. Anne Hutchinson's religious views have stirred up far too much trouble in Massachusetts, so she must be banned from their colony. The men will prove to be successful in their mission, but not before they experience firsthand the brilliance of the woman standing in front of them. After being banned from Massachusetts, Anne Hutchinson and her followers will take up refuge with Roger Williams in Narragansett Territory, and Williams will watch his experiment in religious freedom grow. The story of Anne Hutchinson's fight with the Puritan leaders in Massachusetts and how it leads to the creation of Rhode Island's second and third towns is what we'll cover in episode four of the Story of Rhode Island podcast. John Winthrop emphatically slams his gavel on the table three times. It's as if he's telling the people of Massachusetts that the controversial opinions of Anne Hutchinson will no longer be tolerated and that the outspoken woman at the center of the meeting house will be silenced once and for all. Winthrop looks at her supporters in disgust, not understanding how they could have so much respect for the views of a woman. He then shifts his views towards Anne Hutchinson herself. While her mostly black attire matches the style of the day, the confidence in her demeanor is the antithesis of how Winthrop expects a woman to act. Anne Hutchinson looks right back at Winthrop with a determined look on her face, letting him know that she's ready for the showdown that's about to ensue. Then, Winthrop takes a minute to stand up and makes his initial statement to the people of the court. He states, quote, Mistress Hutchinson, you are called here as one of those that have troubled the peace of the Commonwealth, and the church is here. You are known to be a woman that hath had a great share in promoting and divulging of those opinions that are the cause of this trouble, unquote. Winthrop's initial statement is certainly accurate, as Anne Hutchinson's religious views have shattered the unity of the colony and the town has grown completely divided. The governor then continues to explain to the court how Anne has gone about sharing her controversial opinions. Winthrop states, quote, You have maintained a meeting and an assembly in your house that has been condemned by the General Assembly as a thing not tolerable nor comely in the sight of God nor fitting for your sex, unquote. The meetings that John Winthrop is referring to, the one he finds so insulting for a woman to be hosting, are the meetings that Anne Hutchinson hosted at her house so that she could expand on the minister's sermons that occurred earlier in the week. Initially, these meetings were simply used to help others further understand the Word of God. As word of Anne's deep understanding of the Bible spread, the meetings grew to the point where 20% of Boston's entire adult population were attending her meetings. However, these meetings became problematic when Anne started criticizing the minister's abilities to preach about a topic that's very important to the Puritans, the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace is essentially the belief that one can only find salvation through the grace of God, and that there's nothing an individual can do to affect whether or not they go to heaven. Since the Puritans are devout believers in predestination, they firmly believe in the covenant of grace. Anne then began telling her followers that there are only two ministers in all of Massachusetts who clearly preach about the covenant of grace, her brother-in-law, John Wheelwright, and the famous Puritan minister, John Cotton. Over time, the town of Boston became completely divided over the views of Anne Hutchinson. 
As John Winthrop looks at the courtroom on this frigid November day, he can see that division in the crowd. When Winthrop finishes making his statement to the court, and begins citing scripture to explain why women have just as much right to host biblical meetings as men. First, she tells the biblical story of when Paul told Titus that the elder woman should instruct others in the community so that the people can better understand the word of God. John Winthrop is not pleased and criticizes her example, so Anne quotes another piece of scripture. This time, Anne reminds Governor Winthrop of how Apollo became an excellent minister after receiving instruction from a woman named Priscilla. Although providing Winthrop with another perfectly suitable example, Winthrop once again tells her that the scripture she's quoted is insufficient. It's at this point when Anne becomes annoyed and asks John Winthrop how much proof she needs to show him. Does she need to show him a piece of scripture that has her name written in it? Anne Hutchinson's supporters find themselves entertained by Anne's wit, so they can't help but to chuckle amongst themselves. One of the people laughing is a man by the name of William Coddington, one of Anne's most powerful supporters and without a doubt, her richest supporter. William Connington managed to become so economically successful in Boston that he's built the town's very first brick house, an impressive feat given how rare brick was in 17th century New England. Connington was at one point a magistrate himself, but has since lost that position after choosing to support Anne Hutchinson's controversial views. Chuckling alongside William Connington is Anne's husband, William Hutchinson. William made a fortune after inheriting his father's textile business in England, and he brought that wealth with him when moving to Massachusetts with his wife in 1634. However, the respect William Hutchinson once had from the magistrates of Massachusetts has completely withered away after it became clear he would make no attempts to silence his wife's outspoken ways. When William Connington and William Hutchinson take a moment to lift their heads up from laughing, they realize that the magistrates are furiously looking their way. The two men quickly wipe the smirks off their faces, as if they were a couple of schoolboys who just got caught laughing in class. The deputy governor, Thomas Dudley, doesn't find Anne's wit very entertaining, so he shifts the topic back to the primary issue at hand, Anne's criticism of the Massachusetts ministers. Dudley begins telling the court how Anne has claimed that the ministers do not preach about a covenant of grace, but preach in favor of a covenant of works instead. Such a claim, if proven true, would be extremely damaging for Anne, and certainly enough reason to have her banned from Massachusetts. The term covenant of works directly contradicts the Puritans' belief that God has already predetermined who will go to heaven, because it's saying that an individual's works can have an effect on their salvation. But Anne quickly corrects Dudley, and explains how she never said such a thing. Instead, she was simply saying that the Massachusetts ministers do not preach a covenant of grace as clearly as as John Cotton and John Wheelwright. John Winthrop jumps in and loudly tells the court that she's lying. Anne Hutchinson, unfazed by his unnecessarily loud tone, dares him to prove it. She challenges him to call up witnesses to testify that she said the ministers only preach about a covenant of works. John Winthrop is taken back by the audacity of Anne Hutchinson. How dare this woman challenge me, he thinks to himself. So Winthrop takes her up on the challenge and calls up six ministers to tell the court about the criticisms that they've heard from Anne Hutchinson. The ministers provide their testimonies to the court, but none are able to definitively claim that Anne said that they only preach a covenant of works. Annoyed by their testimonies, Winthrop continues to push them harder and continues to bombard them with questions. But to Winthrop's surprise, none are able to give him the evidence he needs to find Anne guilty. As the hours pass, it's beginning to look as though the magistrates will never find a reason to ban Anne from their colony. William Coddington and William Hutchinson begin to breathe a sigh of relief as things are going her way. However, the sense of relief that Anne's supporters feel quickly withers away when Anne begins addressing the court on her own accord. Anne states, quote, If you please give me leave, I shall give you the grounds of what I know to be true. Unquote. William Hutchinson can tell by his wife's voice that she's about to make a very bold statement, so he becomes worried. The magistrates are caught off guard by her tone as well and find themselves threatened by the very fact that Anne is addressing the court without being asked a question. Then, Anne Hutchinson continues to tell the court how years ago she received a revelation through scripture and she now knows who is a true teacher of the Lord and who is not. She tells the court how since that day she's only been willing to hear the preaching of John Cotton and John Wheelwright as none other would suffice. As Anne continues to tell the crowd about a revelation through scripture, the crowd watches along in awe. In Puritan New England, 
It was rare for even a minister to have a revelation through scripture, but for a woman to have one was almost entirely unacceptable. But the courtroom has yet to hear the end of Anne's point. She still has more to say. Anne states, quote, For the Lord has let me distinguish between the voice of my beloved and the voice of the Antichrist. Unquote. When one of the magistrates asked her how she knew it was the Lord that was instructing her of such a thing, she responds with a question of her own. Anne responds by asking, How is it that Abraham knew that it was the Lord who instructed him to murder his son and break the sixth commandment? To which Dudley responds, quote, By an immediate voice, unquote. To which Anne replies, quote, So to me, by an immediate revelation, unquote. As soon as the words leave Anne's mouth, William Connington and William Hutchinson look at each other in shock. They can't believe what they've just heard her say. Along with saying she's had a revelation through scripture, Anne is now also claiming that she had an immediate revelation as well. Such a claim is acceptable for ministers and nobody else, certainly not a woman. John Winthrop, knowing he now has what he needs to ban Anne from Massachusetts, sits there and smiles. On the other hand, William Hutchinson sits in the crowd, hoping that Anne will recant her statement. But she does not. She's fully devoted to the act of defiance she is committing. Dudley slams his fist on the table and once again asks Anne how she knew she was receiving guidance from the Lord, to which Anne once again responds that it was by an immediate revelation. Anne, in reaffirming her claim of having experienced a direct revelation from God, has officially committed heresy. And at that very moment, Anne's fate is sealed. The court session carries on for another couple of hours, and Anne Hutchinson's followers try to vouch for her innocence, but it doesn't matter. The magistrates will not allow a woman to claim that she's capable of having the same type of connection with God as the Puritan's brightest ministers. Knowing that Anne will be forced to leave Massachusetts after the winter, her followers begin secretly meeting to determine where they will go next. It's during this difficult period where William Coddington becomes the new leader of the Hutchinson Party and will begin playing a pivotal role in the history of Rhode Island. As Anne Hutchinson sits alone in house arrest during the winter of 1637 and into 1638, William Coddington begins communicating with Roger Williams. Williams tells Coddington that Anne's supporters should join him in Narragansett territory. William's tiny town of Providence has managed to remain sovereign for almost two years now, and there's an island in Narragansett Bay that'd be a perfect place for a new settlement. Williams tells Coddington how some people call the island a quidnick, but how many people also refer to it as Rhode Island. Coddington has heard other Englishmen call Quidnick Island Rhode Island as well, but has never understood why they call it that name. Therefore, he asks Williams where the name Rhode Island came from, to which Williams replies, well, we actually don't know what Williams would have told Coddington, because nobody can say for sure where the name Rhode Island came from, an unfortunate truth given the future importance of the name. However, there are some theories. One theory states that it's because when the Italian explorer Giovanni de Verrazzano visited Narragansett Bay in 1524, he noticed how one of the islands was the same size as the Greek island of Rhodes. Some historians believe that early English settlers thought Verrazzano was referring to Aquinnic Island, which inspired them to call it Rhode Island. On the other hand, some believe that it's tied to the Dutch explorer Adrian Block, and how in 1614 he noticed a reddish island at the mouth of Narragansett Bay. Since the word for Red Island in Old Dutch is pronounced Reut Island, it is theorized that the name was eventually turned into Rhode Island. Unfortunately, neither of these theories have been definitively proven, so we may never know for sure where the name Rhode Island came from. Now, there's one thing I'd like to mention before we jump back into the story. Although the English colonists may call Quinnick Island Rhode Island, I will not be doing so for this podcast because I think it will create some confusion. Instead, I will only refer to Aquinnick Island as Aquinnick Island, and I will use the term Rhode Island when speaking about the colony or state of Rhode Island. Okay, back to the story. Eventually, Roger Williams convinces William Coddington, the de facto leader of the Hutchinson Party, to build their settlement on Aquinnick Island. So with the location of their new home now selected, Anne Hutchinson's followers signed a document uniting them as a new body politic and making William Coddington their head magistrate. Then, the 23 men who signed the document set sail for Narragansett Bay so that they can officially purchase Aquinnick Island from the Narragansett Sachems, Canonicus, and Miantonomi. 
After arriving in Narragansett Bay, they take their ship up a river that the Narragansett call Petaquamscott River, or what we know today as Narrow River. On the western shore of that river, on a piece of land that is now part of South Kingstown, there's a large rock located on a steep hill. It's at this rock where William Coddington and the others officially purchase Aquinnick Island from Canonicus and Miantinomi. The rock that Aquinnick is sold at is known as Petaquamscott Rock, and one can still hike to it today. With the deed for Aquinnick Island in hand, Coddington and the group then begin making their way to their new home. There's an immense feeling of excitement amongst the 23 men when their ship passes Canonicus Island and they arrive at the northern tip of Aquinnick Island. As they step out onto the land and begin exploring their new home, they see a cove connected to the Pocasset River to the east, or what we know today as the Sakonet River. Near the cove, they also find a spring, a key feature of any newly built settlement. The group continues to meander around their new home for a while, but it eventually becomes clear that this is where they will build their settlement. Initially, they call their town Pocasset, but in just a few months, they change the name to Portsmouth. Although they do create somewhat of a theocratic form of government at first, the town grants their citizens the right of complete religious freedom. And so, in the spring of 1638, on the northern tip of Aquinnick Island, the second town in the future state of Rhode Island has just been created. Roger Williams' radical experiment in religious freedom is slowly beginning to grow. A couple of weeks after the founding of Portsmouth, Anne Hutchinson arrives at Aquidneck Island and is reunited with their followers. Unfortunately, the joys from her reunion do not last long, as this group of religious outcasts quickly realizes how hard it is to build a society of their own. As the winter of 1638 approaches, the people of Portsmouth become increasingly annoyed by the fact that Coddington's inner circle of elites have consolidated most of the town's land and political power. It's at this point when we're introduced to a man who will play a pivotal role in the early development of Rhode Island, a man whose passion for his ideas has already gotten him banned from both Massachusetts and Plymouth, a man by the name of Samuel Gordon. Samuel Gordon is certainly a good man, but he has a knack for always stirring up conflict. One could say it's because of his commitment to stand by his friends when they are being mistreated, but at the same time, one could also say it's because he simply doesn't know when to keep his mouth shut. Either way, When Gorton arrives in Portsmouth, Coddington watches his already weakened grip on power become even weaker, until it slips from his hands completely. Gorton takes the side of the common people of Portsmouth, and his passion ignites a political rebellion. Then, in spring of 1639, just a year after Portsmouth was founded, Gorton manages to have Coddington and his regime removed from power, and a new body politic put in place. As one may expect, Coddington is furious. And it's at this point when a multi-decade-long feud is ignited between Coddington and Gorin. However, Coddington knows that for now, he must admit defeat. So he decides to take his entourage to the southern tip of Aquidneck. If he can't be the leader of Portsmouth, then he'll just have to build a town of his own. And that's exactly what he does. The founding of this town, a town that will become the third town in the future state of Rhode Island, takes place in May of 1639. William Coddington and the eight other families who left Portsmouth with him spend May 1st traveling south along the western coast of Aquidneck Island. While on their boat, William Coddington sees that there are still members of the Narragansett tribe living on Aquidneck. This frustrates Coddington because he assumed that the natives would have left the island when it was sold to Coddington and the others back in 1638. But Coddington is quickly beginning to realize that the English and the natives have a very different understanding of land ownership. While the English see land as a commodity that can be sold from one person to another, the natives see land as something that is to be used and shared by a group of people. Therefore, the Narragansetts on Aquinnick did not think that they were selling the island to Coddington and the others back in 1638. But instead, they thought that they were granting them access to use the land alongside of them, giving the Narragansetts no reason to leave Aquinnick. The misunderstanding taking place between Coddington and the Narragansetts is not unique to these two groups of people, but instead symbolizes a much larger set of disagreements taking place between English colonists and tribes throughout New England. But even though Coddington is annoyed by the Narragansett's presence on the island, he knows that there are more pressing items to deal with first, like creating the town he set out to build. As the group continues to travel towards the southern end of Aquinnick, 
They see the same thing that Giovanni de Verrazzano saw when he visited Narragansett Bay over a hundred years earlier. Large patches of land that have been cleared out of the forest by the Narragansett tribe. Coddington smiles, as he knows it will be easy to convert these open lands into farms. On top of that, Coddington is already well aware that the island is almost completely void of the wolves that have killed so much of the English livestock throughout New England. Therefore, he's confident that their livestock will thrive once the cleared lands are turned into farms. But nothing excites Coddington more when they arrive at the harbor at the southern end of the island. The harbor is not only well protected by the southern tip of Aquidneck, but also provides easy access to the Atlantic Ocean, giving it the potential to become a major hub for seaborne trade. Coddington wants to continue exploring the harbor, but when one of the other men on the trip, a man by the name of John Clark, notices a body of water on the island, he convinces Coddington that it's time to begin exploring on foot. Coddington reluctantly agrees, so the group anchors their ship and begins hiking towards the body of water. Eventually, they arrive at their destination and find out that the body of water on the island is in fact a spring. After realizing that they've just found a fresh source of water for their town, the men and women begin to celebrate their discovery. That is, all of them except for William Coddington. Coddington is too distracted by more grandiose thoughts to care about the spring. While the others are thinking about the town's short-term needs, Coddington is imagining the town's future economic success. Instead of only seeing clear lands all around him, he pictures rolling farmlands that are filled with livestock. Instead of an empty harbor to the west, he sees a thriving port filled with ships from distant lands who have come to trade with their town. All around him, he hears hardened ship captains talking in various languages, telling their men to hurry up and unload the wooden crates filled with goods. Coddington can already taste the fine wines and liquors that are being carried off of the ships. He pictures a town full of energy and excitement, and at the center of this activity is Coddington himself, the man who will become wealthy beyond imagination from the town's economic success. Coddington's visions will prove to be accurate but it will take another couple of decades for his dreams to come to fruition. Then, Coddington feels a hand on his shoulder, and he's brought back to reality. The images he's just created begin to fade from his mind, and he's reminded that for now, their town is but a handful of families and a tiny spring. The man tells Coddington that they need to come up with a name for their town, and he hints at the fact that they expect Coddington to be the one to create that name. So after taking a minute to think, and while remaining confident that the town will one day become the new hub for seaborne trade in the New World, Coddington decides to name the town Newport. The group loves the name, and is excited to begin building the town of Newport. So although the founding of Newport in May of 1639 means the creation of Rhode Island's third town, it's also the moment when a seed of economic prosperity is planted in Rhode Island. And it's a seed that will continue to grow for over a century. The spring that Newport was founded at no longer exists today. Thankfully, the town of Newport is building a park at the present-day intersection of Spring and Toro Street to commemorate where the spring once stood and where the town of Newport first began. Unfortunately, Anne Hutchinson, the woman who inspired this group of religious outcasts to flee Massachusetts for a quidnick, will not live long enough to see Newport flourish. In 1642, Anne Hutchinson leaves Portsmouth for New Netherland and builds a home in present-day New York City. However, shortly after arriving, Anne and most of her family are murdered during a raid by one of the local tribes. So while the 1640s mark the end of Anne Hutchinson's story, it's just the beginning of William Coddington's. First, he manages to convince the Narragansetts to fully vacate the island by making a few additional payments to their sachems. Then, Coddington convinces Portsmouth to coexist with Newport by operating under a joint government. Similar to the town of Providence, their joint government operates democratically and decides to uphold the right of religious liberty for its citizens. Now, although Roger Williams' experiment in religious liberty is certainly growing, its very survival is about to be threatened. In 1640, Samuel Gorton leaves Aquidneck Island for Providence after he was banned from Portsmouth and Newport for insulting Coddington's power during an outburst in court. It's at this point when even more internal challenges arise, and the larger, far more resourceful colony of Massachusetts begins asserting its control over the towns around Narragansett Bay, primarily Providence. Massachusetts is in dire need of new land, 
So they use these disputes to justify why they should be able to claim jurisdiction over the towns of Providence, Portsmouth, and Newport. By 1642, Massachusetts expansionist designs proved to be successful. And before long, it's beginning to look as though the tiny towns around Narragansett Bay will be swallowed up by Massachusetts, destroying Roger Williams' experiment in religious freedom and preventing the state of Rhode Island from ever existing. Roger Williams will have to act fast, or he'll watch his experiment in religious freedom come to an abrupt end. But that's a story for next time on Episode 5 of the Story of Rhode Island Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Story of Rhode Island. If you are enjoying the podcast, please be sure to leave a review and to follow the podcast as well. You can also follow me on Instagram at Story of Rhode Island or on Facebook at the Story of Rhode Island Podcast. Thank you again and see you next time.